have your Bible, I would invite you to turn with me this morning to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 9, Joshua chapter 1. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines hope as to cherish a desire in anticipation or to desire with expectation of obtainment or fulfillment. Hope is what gets people out of the bed in the morning, isn't it? When, when you wake up in the morning and, and you have no hope for that day going anywhere good, you're halfway tempted to just say, you know what, today I'm just not. We're, we're probably just going to stay in bed today because my, my chances of a successful day will greatly increase if I do nothing at all. <laughs> it's what keeps people going. It's what, it's what gets them out of bed. It's, it, it's the, the thing that keeps people moving to, to their intended goal. It's what keeps people alive on desert islands. Am I right? Castaway? He's hoping that he's going to get off the island. Like, he really thinks that he and Wilson, they're going to make it. But it's only hope. If he said, there's no way I'm getting off of this island, what's he probably going to do? He's probably just going to sit there and die. So here's the question. If you lost everything and every one, Everything that matters in life to you, would you still have hope? If you lost everything, everyone that you love left, died, something, you had no one, you had nowhere, you had nothing, would you still have hope? It's only the Christian who can say yes. It's only the Christian who can say yes. I still have hope. The courage to live when the future looks scary. The question is, where does your hope lie? We're about to take up and read, but before we do, let us ask for the Lord's help in prayer. O oh, great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, O oh Lord. We thank you that we are able to gather together as saints and to study your word. Lord, guide our hearts and our minds. Fix them on you. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to know your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord from Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I, will, uh, I have given to you. Just I, as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way pros prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong 
and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That is the inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of our Lord. May he add his blessing to it. So the question um, is, what will the Israelites hope lie in? What will the Israelites hope lie in? So, so up to this point in uh, the, the books of Scripture, as we're going out through the narrative of Scripture, we've just made it to the death of Moses. Just made it to the death of Moses. In fact, uh, at the very end of the book of Deuteronomy. And as I'm always reading through, through Scripture, I get to that point and I always get a little choked up because you've gone through so much with Moses already. And then here he is, uh, his eyes have not dimmed, um, he's still well off, and he, he cr- cr- uh, climbs up to the top of a mountain to look into uh, the promised land, but he doesn't get to go in. And there he dies. And you're like, oh, what? Oh, gosh, there's, the, the, what, what's going on? The, the, the patriarch, the leader, the one who has taken them out of Egypt and brought them through the wilderness these 40 years, who has been the one faithful servant in the people of God, who has gone before the people in their stupidity and says, no, God, don't, don't have your wrath on these people. Don't uh, be, be with them. Turn your wrath away from them. It's gone. And so it looks like at this point, well, the story is over. But the story is a long way from over. Joshua, the son of Nun, he has been Moses' assistant for quite some time now. And so he's been given charge by uh, the declaration of God to Moses to, to ordain Joshua to be the leader of the people. And so that's exactly what it is. And Joshua will be the one who takes them through into the promised land. And so he, he is now the leader. He, he's commanded to take them, uh, just as Moses had through the Red Sea, take them through the River Jordan and into the Promised Land. So verses 2 through 4, uh, God, God speaks to him, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, speaking directly to Joshua, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving you. And then he gives... Um, uh, in essence, the territory that they will have. And it's a massive piece of land, right? It, the, everything from the Euphrates River to Lebanon to all of where the Hittites are, uh, this, this big place, it's going to be all of yours. And he marks this out for him. And then verses 5 and 6, he gives the promise to Joshua. He tells him, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Then he gives him a command. Be strong and courageous for you, Joshua, shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to their fathers to give them. So, so he's just said, like, the, the, the commander, the leader, the one who had actually heard from God who, who God had given this law, he had spoken directly to him, is gone. Now it's Joshua, and God is speaking to Joshua. Joshua is the new Moses. And he's saying, don't worry, I got you. Don't worry, I got you. Uh, I got Moses through the Red Sea. I carried him out. You saw the plagues. I'm with him. I was through all of that with Moses. I'm with you. Now, here's what you're going to do. Okay? Be strong. Be courageous. Don't wimp out. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't wimp out on me. Hang tight. For it is you. He will be the one who carries them through. For it will be you that shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. God is saying, I've promised generations and generations ago that this place, I promised Abraham, this place would be his children's. I'm going to see it through. My words don't fall away. So be strong because I am with you. Then in verses 7 and 8, he reaffirms this and then he gives him further directions. First he tells him, I will be with you. And then 7 and 8, he again says, only be strong and very courageous. Further, 
being careful to do all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. So, so he's saying, be, be careful. Keep everything, right? So the whole time they're in the wilderness, what's Israel doing? Not what God commanded them to do, right? Yeah. Uh, Moses is up on the mountain. He's getting the, the, the Ten Commandments and, and uh, the first uh, several there. Uh, uh, have no other gods before me. Don't make idols. What were they doing? They were having other gods before me and they were making idols. They had just, br- I mean, just obliterated it right there. And so Moses has to br- break the tablets and, and get some more because they had already broken the covenant. And so uh, he's saying, listen, I will be your God, but I am a holy and righteous God. Therefore, my people must be holy and righteous also. And you're their leader. You're their leader. You have to be holy and righteous. You have to go before them. You have to be the one who leads them. Therefore, you must keep all the law. He goes further in verse 8. He tells him how he's supposed to keep all. The law, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. This word in Hebrew for meditate, but you shall meditate on it day and night, means to actually murmur. He's supposed to kind of walk around. Speaking the commandments to himself day and night, constantly saying it over and over again. And over again. And then he tells him why he's supposed to meditate on it. So that, key word, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Again, the word all there is is a big boom. Take it, all, all of it. Do all of the law. For, in doing this, then you will make your way prosperous. And you will have good success. Now this isn't, This isn't so much, um, if you keep the law, you'll get everything you ever want, right? You'll just, you'll get good stuff, and it'll be fine. No, what he's saying is, if you keep this law, if you obey what is written, then I will make your way prosperous. So whenever the Israelites go astray, time and time again throughout the Old Testament, in essence, what they're saying is, God's not sufficient, God, God is not sufficient. He's not meeting our needs. That's why uh, throughout the ancient world, there were so many deities. And so they would, they would pray to the, the Baals. And, and if the harvest wasn't good that year, they would say, well, well, Baal is not listening to us, so we have to go and worship uh, Moloch. And, but, but if uh, you know, the, 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 the reproduction of their cattle isn't good the next year, they say, well, Moloch isn't taking care of us. We have to go and worship the Asherahs. But God is saying, these are all false deities. You want success. You want me to take care of you. You want me to dwell in your midst. You must be holy as I am holy. Keep my law and I will protect you. But first he's speaking to Joshua in particular there. I want you to hear that. Joshua is the leader. Meditate on this day and night. So throughout the law, it's always commanded that the kings uh, in Deuteronomy 19, a, 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 a command is given that the kings shall keep the law. They shall be ones who memorize it in order that they can lead the people rightly. He has to meditate on it day and night. And then finally, in verse 9, he, he gives this question, have I not commanded you? And he has. And this has happened throughout the the Old Testament already in the first five books of the Old Testament. He tells them, be strong and courageous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. He's saying, don't doubt. Don't doubt me. Don't think that when times get hard that I'm not going to show up. When, when stuff kind of uh, uh, gets out of hand and, and it looks like the odds are stacked against you, don't think that I'm not going to show up. Have I not promised you this? Have my words 
not been fulfilled. Every single thing that I've said thus far, has it not come true? Of course it has, because I'm God. He's saying, don't doubt me. For the Lord your God is with you. He's with you wherever you go. It's an encouragement that God's word has come true. God's word doesn't fall short. So be strong and courageous. Follow the Lord. Now then, when, when we come to, to these texts in particular, uh, we always kind of go a little bit astray when we try to, to understand how does this apply to us. And we'll come here and we'll look at this text and say, be strong and courageous, I dig that. I like that. I'll be strong and courageous. But then we also, in seeing be strong and courageous, for God is with us, we kind of skip over the whole part. Also keep all the commandments. Like keep them all. All of them. Keep them all. And so we, we put ourselves in the position of Joshua. We are now Joshua. We're going to keep all the law, uh, and we're going to lead some folks through the Jordan River into a nice promised land. But that's not what this text is actually about, or the Old Testament, for that matter. Do you want to know what it's about? It's about Jesus. That good old Sunday school answer. What's it about? It's about Jesus. Right! You get two stars. They don't mean anything, but they make you feel good. That's correct. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the true and better Joshua. He is the one who takes us through the, the wilderness into the eternal promised land. He is the true and better. And so I want to see this through three points. Three points of application. First, our problem with perfection. Secondly, our perfect Savior and thirdly, our perpetual hope of a promised paradise. The alliteration is on fire this morning. Let me say those again. One, our problem with perfection. Two, our perfect Savior. And three, our perpetual hope of a promised paradise. First, our problem with perfection. Let's look at verses 7 and 8. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, has commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Uh, to the right or to the left. Um, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. There are uh, 646 commands, I believe, throughout the Old Testament. Uh, or, sorry, throughout the, the first five books of uh, the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, known as the Torah. 646, he's saying keep them all. Now, they can all be understood and seen under the Ten Commandments, but there are 646 some odd uh, commands throughout the Old Testament. Keep them all. God is perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. And we are not. How many of y'all, you, you get a, um, uh, like, like you get a, uh, a new iPad or a new iPhone or something like that, and, and it has the nice terms and conditions uh, page? How many of you have actually ever read it? Be honest. Exactly. Exactly. One, the words are, 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 like, are, are microscopic. You would need a microscope for your microscope to read all that fine print. Am I right? So you're getting to that, and then it's like 12 pages of the smallest print you've ever seen before in your life, and you're like, no. And then it has the nice little checkered box down at the bottom. Did you read it? <laughs> and you're like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I read it. Next one. The fine print. The interesting thing about Scripture is there is no fine print. 
There is no fine print. The Bible is very clear what is required of us. The commands are blatant. They're obvious. They're there in written form. Clear as day. But we just don't follow it. We're always falling short. Our problem is perfection, with perfection is the fact that we're not perfect. And we never will be. In our own selves, we are incapable of perfection to the standard that God commands of us. Have we kept all the law? Have we kept all 600 some odd commands of the Old Testament? No, we haven't. If anybody ever tells you that, they're they're lying. Broken the Ten Commandments, boom. So, uh, right there. So therefore, are we capable of leading ourselves through the promised land? No, we're not. Are we able to, in our own righteousness, stand before God and say, we are good enough? Of course not. Of course not. And that's the, that's the scary thing. That's the scary thing about living in the South, isn't it? We, we've grown up with people who have been in church all of their lives who, who have never really been born again. But what do they say? I grew up in church. I've gone to church every single Sunday. That's good enough. I do good things. But where does their hope lie? Not in Jesus. Not in Jesus. Their hope lies in the fact that they've come to church and they've done what they're supposed to do and they've given uh, to, to, to charity and they've, they've done good things. They help the little lady across the street whenever she's going to get her groceries. But those merits aren't good enough. Nothing that we can do is ever good enough to get us to the true and better eternal promised land. That's our problem with perfection. It's for us, it's unobtainable. But there's good news. There's true hope. Point two, our perfect Savior. Let's look at verses five through six. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Listen to this. For you, speaking to Joshua, for you will cause this people to inherit the land that I swore their fathers to give them. It will be you. What do we need? We need a righteous leader. Someone who is able to actually keep all the law. Our problem with perfection is we're not perfect. But there's hope. Because there's one who is. A perfect savior, a perfect leader who dies as our substitute on our behalf. That's none other than Jesus. He is the true and better Joshua. His his Jewish, his Hebrew name is actually Joshua. It means salvation. Isn't that interesting? So every time you see Joshua here in the book of Joshua, it's saying salvation will lead you through into the promised land. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that attest to the fact that there's one author of Scripture? This whole redemptive history is unfolding to the glory of God in the person, His Son, Christ. It's a glorious truth. All of this was unfolding, pointing forward to the true and better Savior, the true and better Joshua. We have a perfect Savior. So so what are we supposed to do? Uh, uh, We have one who has kept the law perfectly we should be like him we should follow him and we should be like him i saw an interview here a while back 
um, it was a, a little boy, and, uh, and there was a, a big fire in this um, downtown uh, inner city uh, apartment complex, and there was, there was a fire, and he and his mom were trapped like on like the 20th floor or something like that, and there was no way out. There was no way he was going to get it. He and his mom were going to get out of that fire. And so the, the firemen have this big, long ladder. And so they finally get up there. And of course, the mom's just trying to hand off this little kid. You know, save the kid, save the kid, save the kid. Well, the fireman saves both of them. He saves both of them. Uh, they're, they're freed. The, the fire's put out. Everyone's saved. 20 years later, uh, that fireman gets a letter from the little boy. And he's like, thank you so much for what you've done. But because you saved me, now I'm a fireman too. People want to be like the ones who saved them, don't they? The little boy had been saved by the fireman, so he said, I want to be like that fireman. Christian, Christ has saved us. Do you want the, the whole focus of the Christian life? It's daily getting up and saying, I want to be like Jesus. I want to live like Jesus. I want to grow in my holiness. I want to know the word of God. I want to be without sin. I want to go out into the world and tell people about Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. It's that simple. And that's always the difference, isn't it? The ones who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, they understand their problem with perfection. They understand that their merit is never enough, but they also understand that Christ has died and he's died for them. Therefore, their life changes. There is this all-consuming spirit about them that says, I have to be like Jesus. Take all these things from me, but give me Jesus perfect savior so we should be like him and then thirdly our perpetual hope of a promised paradise verses two through four therefore arise and go over this jordan you and all this people into the land that i am giving to them to the people of israel and then he gives the space, the perpetual hope of a promised paradise. People live their lives looking forward to something, don't they? Every single day, right? You, you meet those people, you work with those people who on Monday morning, they come dragging into work. How, how was your weekend? It was amazing. It was so good. I enjoyed it so much. Cool. Are you ready to work? No, I'm ready for 5 p.m. Friday. I'm not ready to work. I'm ready for 5 p.m. Friday. What do they live for? They live for the weekend. Where is their hope lying? It's in the fact that on Friday afternoon, they don't have to show up anymore. They can do what they want. Or the people... Who, who, who live for vacation. Now, vacation's a good thing, don't get me wrong. But people who live for vacation, right? They, they work 51 weeks out of the year for their one week off at the beach. And if they could figure out how to not take the kids, they would do it. They would do it. Okay? We're just, I, if I could just make it to... To, to Panama City Beach. They've got it marked on their calendar, highlighted with all sorts of stickers. And the kids roll by and are like, Dad, it's, it's not that uh, exciting. It's like, shh, shh, yes it is. This is the greatest week of my life because I don't have to worry about anything. They live for vacation. There are people here who, who in Murray County who, who like uh, uh, build up all of their vacation days for Mule Day. <laughs> I can't wait for Mule Day because then I get to spend my vacation. That is their vacation. 
And so what, do, what does their hope lie in? Their hope lies in vacation, uh, in, in Mule Day. It's great, sure, if you, if you really like double fried Oreos, yeah, I guess it's fun. <laughs> it's a vacation and a hospital trip, all in one. You get extra days off that way. Cool. Their hope rests in things coming. But the Christian life lies in something eternal, something greater, something far, far superior. It's a perpetual hope of a promised paradise. It's an eternity with Jesus perfectly. The sweetest thing about eternity with Christ and eternity in the presence of an almighty and holy God is one, we're there. But two, we're without sin. We're like Jesus. Finally, the Christian life goes and it works to glorify God and to be more like Jesus. And then it concludes and what happens in this cataclysmic, wonderful uh, time, we are finally like Jesus, without sin. That should stir us up in the morning, shouldn't it? Listen, today might be a hard day, but it's okay because I have another opportunity today to be like Jesus, to point somebody to Jesus, to read the scriptures and see Jesus clearer and better and know him more. And if I don't make it home today, that's okay too. Because then I get to perfectly be like Jesus in our perpetual hope of a promised paradise. The Christian life isn't one that lives for the moment, if you will. The Christian life isn't a life that's even lived for this life, interestingly enough. The Christian life is the life lived in light of the eternal reality that we get to be with Jesus and we get to be like Jesus. Therefore, we say daily, what is our hope built in? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. That's our hope. What do we do when our future looks scary? Christian, don't be afraid. You can be strong because Jesus was strong. You don't have to be afraid because Jesus took your penalty for you. Be not afraid and be not dismayed. You weren't forsaken, but he was for us. God has come God has dwelt among us. God has died on behalf of sinners. Therefore, we have perpetual hope. Let us pray. O oh, great God and Heavenly Father, we just have to thank you for your Son. The place where our hope lies is in none other than than Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, you have done a work in us, those who are in him. We can live our lives with a daily hope that your will will be done, that you will keep us, O oh God. We have been created anew, and we can constantly cast our eyes to our eternal reality that is eternity with you guide our hearts and our minds now O lord that this truth might sink deeply and that we might have a renewed spirit O god that even in this time of trial whatever it may be in each of our lives O lord we have hope and lord if we were to lose everything today we would still have Jesus. 
Therefore, we have hope. Help this truth to sink deeply, Lord, that we might preach it to ourselves, that we might come to this Scripture, and we might meditate on it day and night, that Your words will be in our mouths and will not depart from them. Send us, O Lord, into the world now. Give us a burden for the lost that they might have this same hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.